Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Dr. Andy Chi, a research fellow with the Complex Security and Development Program here at the IISS. Let me welcome you all this afternoon to our third access session, which aims to hear from an important voice from the African continent drawn from the world of politics, business, and academia. Today's Africa session will focus on Ethiopia. Ethiopia is on the journey to move itself and the Horn of Africa towards a more integrated, peaceful, and successful future. This was recently recognized by the Norwegian Nobel Committee, who honors His Excellency Prime Minister Dr. Adi Ahmed for his achievements as a peacemaker. Within the first few months of taking office, the PM ended the 20 years of hostility with Eritrea by agreeing to give up disputed territory. He lifted the state of emergency, ordered the release of thousands of prisoners, allowed exiled dissidents to return home, unblocked hundreds of websites and TV channels, and appointed a significant number of women to ministerial roles. Regionally, Ethiopia continues to assert its role as a leader, which champions the promotion of peace and security in the Horn. Ethiopia has also played a leading role in mediating between Sudan's tradition, a transitional military council and the Alliance of Freedom and Change. Today, Ethiopia contributes over 7,000 troops and police to UN peacekeeping missions in Darfur, Abia, and South Sudan. It also contributes 4,400 active personnel to the African Union peacekeeping force in Somalia and hosts over 900,000 refugees from South Sudan and Somalia. <coughs> Despite these efforts, Ethiopia is at a crossroad. The pace of change in Ethiopia has, has been so fast that many have questioned the PM's overall approach. The ethiopia eritrea border has since been closed and there has been a surge of internal conflicts. Finally, the, the Grand Ethiopian Resonance Dam, which will be the largest hydroelectric power plant uh, in Africa, appears to have led to declining relations with Egypt. I am delighted to have with us uh, a seasoned diplomat, His Excellency Ambassador Fizzo Sewell, who will outline and address Ethiopia's foreign policy priorities, its strategic position in the Horn of Africa, and also tackle how many of these tackle many of these issues as well. His Excellency was appointed as High Commissioner in London on February 2019. He joined the Ethiopian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1990. As a career diplomat, he has served at a diplomatic mission to the Republic of South Sudan from 2015 to 2018, in Kenya as Deputy Head of Mission from 2010 to 2014, in Somalia from 2005 to 2008, and in Egypt from 1995 to 2001. He was assigned to various Post within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including Deputy Chief of Cabinet, Chief Advisor to the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, EGAD, and Deputy Head of Somali Office. This event will be on the record, so without further waiting, I'll hand the floor over to His Excellency, and then we'll open for a QA session. Your Excellency. Thank you, Andrew. Colleagues, brothers, sisters, and especially Ambassador T. Morris, who was with me in Juba. Uh, when I was in South Sudan. Glad to meet you. And some of the colleagues I saw you here, uh, we know each other. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm very delighted, I'm grateful to IISSS uh, to invite me here to address you. And uh, yes, uh, as you said it, uh, I don't look my age, but uh, I have served a very <laughs> long time in, uh, in my uh, to my country, almost three decades. So it is a pleasure to share what I passed through, uh, mostly in the Horn of Africa, from Cairo to Mogadishu, from Djibouti to South Sudan, and uh, the neighborhoods. So uh, it is really a pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, let me say uh, whatever I have, and then uh, hopefully it will be more interactive and uh, you will be uh, provoking me to say more, uh, which I didn't cover in my presentation. Uh, you started it uh, very well. Uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, my Prime Minister getting the Nobel Peace Prize for 2019. And uh, many say that uh, some, uh, it is too early for my Prime Minister to get it. But if you closely see, uh, Ethiopia undemocratic, 
sometimes doing good, sometimes in difficulties. But uh, 100 years uh, as a modern state, we had so many problems accumulating one uh, after another. And this prime minister, in a year's time, this is what he was trying to unlock what has been there for 100 years back. And uh, to mention a few, uh, as you rightly said it, half of his cabinet is women. And not only women, but the most important posts are uh, appointed women. Uh, Ethiopia, the, all sorts of politicians, mainly leftists, uh, it seems sometimes that we are not able to live without an enemy. And this prime minister is saying, external, internal, we don't need to have an enemy to exist as a government or to survive in power. So he's saying it's possible, come in the campaign, let's put the vote, and then if you convince people, persuade people, you take it. That is as simple as that. And he meant it. There is no way I doubt him. Uh, not only that, uh, the opposition in Ethiopia has never existed with the government in the same city and in the, in the same country. We simply did not have that culture. And now, mortal enemies used to be mortal enemies. Now, in the capital, if you see the Oromo Liberation Front and Tigray People's Liberation Front, unless they eliminate each other, they cannot live in the same country. But now they are operating in Addis Ababa, both of them. And some of them in Tigray, some of them in the Oromo region, eastern part of Addis Ababa, and northern part of Addis Ababa. They are there. And uh, if you see the EPRP, the student movement, in 1960s and 70s, and now they are with uh, center-right and uh, ethnic-based parties with them in the same town. This simply is impossible to happen in Ethiopia. And it is what my prime minister did. Uh, to my country. So, uh, media, some of them in London, most of them in the US, in Kenya and Asmara. We were day and night from abroad bombarded by opposition media. And at home, no di oh, the differences of opinion is entertained. Not at all. But now he told them, why you report from Asmara? Why you report from London? Why you report from uh, Washington? Come down all here, open your offices, and you just insult me if you want to. You campaign against me if you want to. Exactly that's what they are doing. What we have three, four days ago, maybe you have seen it in the news, we had some hiccups. And it is simply the Prime Minister spoke his mind, and the opposition called in his, uh, their followers, and they had to clash with the police. Because when they go out of the way, they have to be told, come down, come back to the truck. But we are exercising. So the opening up is, uh, uh, it looks like uh, what I have said. So uh, making this possible for the prime minister is another element why he won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, rightly. And on the economy, I mean the overall political situation, security situation is what I told you. And uh, on the economy, Ethiopia is known for a large corporate government uh, organizations running the whole country. And he said this is too inefficient and this is too open for corruption. Otherwise we have to privatize. And now uh, tender is out to privatize uh, telecommunication where we have 50 million mobile subscribers, 50 million out of 110 million people. This is what we brought to the international community, local, uh, foreign, to come and compete and uh, inject money, uh, knowledge, management, whatever. Uh, other uh, big industries like uh, sugar, where we have a competitive advantage, but because of corrupt practices could not move uh, much. Now, it is going to be privatized. So uh, the PPP uh, is going on. Public, uh, private uh, investment uh, is well underway. So by next year, uh, we will be through uh, in most of these endeavors. So the economy, we are trying to privatize uh, uh, to foreign and the local investors. Uh, so uh, we are 
liberalizing uh, the economy uh, that uh, uh, foreign businesses from UK, Europe and America are coming in big ways. Uh, also we have uh, some adjustments in the laws which we are doing it in the parliament to allow uh, both foreign and the local investors to come in and trade to boom. Uh, this is what we have gone through uh, inside the country but this is not without a challenge. Uh, a country that knows a leader who always orders and whenever he orders if there is any uh, disagreement you have to hit uh, like uh, by a bad father this is our view of our leadership now uh, the prime minister is refusing to take action unless he is forced like the last uh, three four days what has happened uh, we have gone through from one extreme to another uh, we used to have the last 100 years impatient leaders never tolerating any disagreement. And now we have a prime minister too tolerant. And earlier our opposition was saying, please, you are overusing your force. Please uh, stop it. And now people are urging him, please tell the order the soldiers to shoot while the police is not arresting. This is the extreme we have come. Uh, we had to choose, but we have chosen uh, the way we are now currently doing. And uh, Ethiopia is in internally in a soul searching. And uh, in this, you may have some uh, groups or opposition going left and right. Uh, but somehow, uh, we learn from each other's mistakes, sometimes costly uh, in human and uh, property but uh, we will settle. Uh, otherwise, uh, the biggest news was uh, the problem we had with Eritrea. Uh, what we have avoided is uh, a well-armed truce on both sides. When we were not well prepared, 1998-2000, when we fought each other, we lost 100,000 troops from both sides, civil, uh, military. And now, after 20 years, if this Prime Minister did not take risk, go to Asmara to shake hands with the President of Eritrea, suppose we didn't do that, and somehow one side made a mistake, and the killing we would have is more than one million, because we are better armed, better devastating weapons, and better prepared. So that is what he has avoided, simply flying to Asmara. As far as I know, it is Anwar Sadat in 1978 who went to Israel to address the Knesset and make peace with Israel and within Egypt. Uh, and you know what happened? Saddam lost, uh, Sadat uh, lost his life, life. And my prime minister was to lose his life three times because what he did. Uh, but still he is prepared to go that route. Uh, and we are no going back. Uh, but some are saying with Eritrea, okay, uh, you shook hands, uh, but the border closed again. Fine. What we have achieved is that would be war uh, had he not uh, made peace with Eritrea. Uh, a likely eruption by mistake or by design, we have avoided it. So now Ethiopia never feels that an Eritrean will shoot from behind. And Eritrea will never feel that Ethiopia will fight, uh, shoot from behind. So there is no possibility of war. But not only with Eritrea, but with the, in the whole region. So interstate conflict, because of my Prime Minister's bold uh, measures, interstate conflict is unthinkable now. We have avoided it. Not only between Ethiopia and Eritrea, but Eritrea and Sudan, and Eritrea and Djibouti which they had to solve still, but we have gone uh, too far. Uh, Eritrea, you may come to ask me later on, but they have their case. And the border closure should not be a big deal, because well, it has been closed for 20 years. If it is closed for a year or six months, it doesn't mean much, because they have to do some adjustments. All right, because the opening up 
uh, we have seen and we are 100% sure would have implication in the internal setup, in the internal politics, in the internal evolution uh, of the politics uh, in Eritrea. So we had to allow them to manage the internal issues and to come back when they are ready. But otherwise, we are ready uh, to, to, to uh, interact economically. Sudan, it is a step forward, a big change in uh, the Horn of Africa. It was 30 years of uh, dictatorship. Uh, highly ideological government and not agreeing with everybody with South Sudan. Team, you know how we were in trouble. And uh, problems with Egypt, Sudan, Egypt, and the problems with uh, Chad or uh, Eritrea. Uh, now, the military and the civil society did compromise, and uh, the people of so uh, Sudan have shown to any likelihood of emergence of dictatorship that they are able to say no. And the people's power is uh, as much as we have seen in the Arab Spring, in the Arab world, it is coming to Horn of Africa, which happened in Ethiopia first, and now Sudan has experienced it. And the outcome is people's uh, power. They have come to compromise and we have a government of national unity in, 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 in Sudan. But never forget, Usually, a coalition governments are like a lost time. They give you peace, they deny you development, simply because of pull and push. And they are preparing in three years for election. So you work more on your constituency on how to win it, rather than doing every day what people are looking for, for uh, expecting from you. So we may have that kind of situation, but it is in the right track. Sudan is in the right track. Uh, Somalia, uh, the setup has a problem. We have uh, the federal government, very weak, and we have the regional authorities, better, stronger than uh, the government. But uh, ethnic and uh, tribal sub sub clan differences are the problems. Uh, and I must say, uh, the constitutional setup does allow that kind of thing to happen. So they have to go back to the switchboard see how federal government and the regions will align to uh, the reconstruction of Somalia. Otherwise, in current situation, I will be uh, amazed after the withdrawal of Amisom if the Somali uh, National Army uh, would uh, take control of the country. It will be a big surprise. Otherwise, we may have to extend uh, the stay uh, of Amisom in Somalia. Otherwise, Al-Shabaab will be very quick to take it. Not because it is popular, but it is terrifying force. They kill and they are intimidating, so people have no, no, no guarantee they are protected by the government in case of Amazon's withdrawal. So we need to work more, but for UK, Europe, the United Nations, African Union, all global world must uh, come in. A relation between Somalia and Somaliland we still have to go a long way. Uh, we are nowhere in that. Uh, we have a problem. Uh, Kenya, uh, the news is it is maritime uh, conflict with Somalia, which my prime minister is trying to mediate. The rhetoric has gone down. The trade of waters has gone down. Uh, so Somalia prefers to go to International Court of Justice. Uh, Kenya is not of that opinion, uh, but uh, we have no, no fear of going to conflict because of the maritime border, because both are content enough uh, to do that. South Sudan, uh, we have to have the unity government in November, uh, but still we have to go a long way, much better. Uh, now, the, the guns are more or less silent in the whole of South Sudan, but still uh, much work is ahead of us, uh, very difficult. And uh, the tribal element, uh, the economic incentives for some individuals, groups and clans is very, very uh, intricate, very, very difficult. And uh, they have gone through 
very bad experiences uh, through uh, the struggle to independence and if after even independence. So we know how uh, most of us were frustrated. In two years after independence, South Sudan went into a terrible war. And again, while both me and the team in uh, South Sudan in 2016, we had it again uh, erupting and up to now like that. But 2018 in Addis Ababa in September, they have signed. According to that signature after postponement, we hope in November we will have the unity government, uh, to which Riyak Mashar still uh, with some uh, 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 complaints. So we have to address that one. Djibouti, uh, I can tell you, uh, the economy of Djibouti and Ethiopia is so integrated, we have reached to a stage where we cannot survive without Djibouti, and Djibouti cannot survive with Ethiopia. And the same arrangement has to go with Kenya, with uh, uh, Eritrea, with Somalia, with uh, Sudan. That is uh, the, the, the thinking uh, from Addis Ababa, that this project is either electricity or importing fuel or using the lab set from Lamu or using Barbara and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, down there Hobio or using Asab or Masawa are peace projects for us so that uh, no one uh, crazy in certain capitals ignites a problem. So that is uh, how we see. And uh, the last point is Egypt. Egypt, uh, these days it is in the news, uh, the issue of the Nile. And uh, last time, uh, three, four days back, my prime minister in Russia, Sochi, they have met with uh, President Sisi and uh, they have agreed to continue uh, uh, the political discussion. Uh, but the technical aspect, the scientists, the water ministry people, and the technicians to continue to talk, and uh, the political discussion also to go ahead, uh, but one without interfering on the other track. These two tracks are separate and different. Uh, but our uh, Ethiopia's uh, firm position which will never change, is that we have to use our water. Because uh, Ethiopia has been in problem. Uh, here in the UK, if you ask older generation people, in 1977 and 1984, people were selling their products uh, to feed an Ethiopian dying there because of hunger. We do not want that to come back while we are on the, on the uh, as they say, it, uh, the water tower of Horn of Africa. We have a lot of water, but it is all going to four directions of Ethiopia, north, west, south, east. That we have to use uh, our water resources and uh, river basins uh, to electrify Ethiopia, which industrialization is not possible, uh, where Ethiopia thinks our, uh, our advantage is in manufacturing. So electrification is a priority, but also irrigation. So this is uh, where we are. And uh, as a region, uh, we, are, we have been the chair of IGAD uh, for like 10 years now, nine years. We are to hand over to Kenya soon. But uh, uh, the neighborhood, uh, which is uh, Gulf of Eden, uh, and uh, the Arabian Peninsula, it is having uh, a direct impact. What we have there has uh, an impact in uh, the Horn of Africa. But these days it is better because the contribution of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates to the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea has been uh, uh, great. Uh, plus, Ethiopia and Eritrea, when we make peace, uh, we have resolved half of our problems within the continent and with um, subcontinent and with the with, with Gulf uh, of Arabia because not necessary now uh, as it used to be if Eritrea goes that side to join Ethiopia must join that side if Ethiopia joins that side Eritrea must join that side that we make sure that we are not standing together in any club that now has changed <coughs> rather we check where are you going Eritrea, Ethiopia where are you falling in, why so we exchange the advantages and disadvantages and we march together as much as possible while differences are tolerated. Otherwise, the last point I want to raise is we are here in UK. Uh, our relationship with the United Kingdom government goes, as I always say, 300, 400 years back. 
And if you see now uh, the diplomatic correspondences between uh, Queen Victoria and my uh, kings uh, since uh, like 300, 400 years back, uh, we were an old kingdom uh, in the region. And since then, we have uh, a good uh, interaction and uh, many of the British explorers and uh, adventurers were in Ethiopia. Many of my people, including the prince who was buried here, uh, came like 151 years ago. So uh, up to now, our relation with UK is uh, one of strategic relationship. And we are very grateful uh, for the universities we are using here and the lot of diaspora coming in here and what not and uh, in terms of economy terrorism migration poverty reduction we are working uh, together and will continue uh, so this is where we are uh, so doctor i better stop here <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much uh, so what i'll do is i'll open the floor to q uh, questions if you could start by lifting your hands and then let me know your affiliations i see nella do you want to go Thank you very much, uh, Alan B, for uh, work here at the Institute in Conflict, Security and Development. Uh, thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. I don't think anyone would disagree with your analysis about Somalia's constitutional weaknesses, uh, but that does make the question about how Ethiopia can balance its partnerships. Um, do you think it's possible for Ethiopia to have good working relations with Mogadishu, with federal member states, and also with Somaliland? And if so, how do you go about managing those tensions? Thank one you. More question. One more question. Mm -hmm. Yes, one more question. One more question. Um, Ali Arsalan Pasha, I'm an intern here at the WLS. Uh, now that after 20 years you've resolved the conflict with Eritrea, uh, now the question is on focusing on domestic policy. Uh, and my question was about how to use the available water resources. You mentioned it briefly, but if you could talk about it more, uh, because if you don't outsource this, you have to reallocate it. How are you going to allocate it with irrigation and electrification in mind? Thank you. Shall we address this too? Mm. My sister, you are right. Uh, it has been uh, <coughs> since my former Prime Minister, Malese, now we took over. Uh, what we did was to improve the relation between Ethiopia and Somalia. And the first thing he did is to allow all Somalis, where they had state collapse, to come to Ethiopia without any requirement, no ID, no photograph, no passport. And we allow them to migrate to Ethiopia. And I grew up in that part of our border. And uh, my father was a military who uh, was deployed uh, to resist Somalia's aggression in the past, twice, 1964, 63, and 1977. And in between so many clashes. Uh, I remember the hatred my father had to Somalis. I grew up in that mentality. And the Somalis, if you go now, if they hate you too much, they will tell you you are Habash, which means an Ethiopian, an Arab Greek word for an Ethiopian, which means it's a burned face. We had that enmity. And then when the, that Prime Minister Malas came in 1991, and Somalia state collapse happened in 1990, the first thing he did is open the door for them. They have come up to Addis Ababa. And we could not believe it that if I had a problem, I would migrate to Mogadishu. And Mogadishu and Somalia, Kismayo or uh, Barbara or uh, Hargeisa would come to up to Addis Ababa uh, to run away any problem they might face. Then that was the first people-to-people -people interaction. Since then, the government cautiously did cultivate a situation with Hargeisa putting their profile up, opening offices, but not recognition. And Somaliland, I mean Puntland, we had to have the Puntland administration with major ten majority, but others included, the different ethnic groups, uh, the, the subclans. And then if you go to Puntland, we still help them address their security. Not only uh, from internal uh, problems, unconstitutional change uh, and helping them to stabilize but also Al-Shabaab 
and ISIS now. We are cooperating. When you go to down to Mogadishu, uh, we had very good relationship before we formed the government in 2004 in Kenya. But we carried them that government, federal government of Somalia, where it could not land, we had to go first to Joha. And from Joha, we had to come to Baidoa. From Baidoa, as Al Shabaab came out in 2005, 2006, we had to send our troops because members of the Security Council, including UK, could not support Somalia. Then Ethiopia had to move in. So our relations since then with the government uh, in Mogadishu is excellent. And we have now the last regional state is uh, Iran Shabale, as well as Kismayo. We had very good relationship. But we have shifted our attention and the way of engagement that we have to work with the federal government, but also if there is any uh, misunderstanding, to use our positive influence to get them together. But we made it very clear to all of them that we deal with the government. And because our uh, criticism we used to receive is Ethiopia's pro, pro warlords, preferring warlords than having Somalia coming together. We want to abandon that. We didn't have that intention at all. Uh, we were looking for Somalia to come together and be our partner. So it is possible to have a good relationship with all of them, but to allow them with their own pace to come together and address all these problems. Otherwise, we are okay. And uh, the water resources, what we are saying is, my brother, uh, if we sit together and allow the engineers, the scientists, foreign and uh, local from Ethiopia, uh, Sudan and Egypt, sit together and see what is the daily usage of Egypt from the Nile for industry, for drinking water, for tourism, for other purposes. What is the need in Sudan? What is the need in Ethiopia? And we have to help, as my Prime Minister emphasized, the greenery of Ethiopia, where we did two months ago like four billion uh, trees in a week. All right? And when we make Ethiopia full of forest, we'll have more rain. When we have more rain, we will have much water in the Nile, so that we may manage it, the availability of water, so that there is no need to quarrel as we have enough water. It is the management that we should focus than the share now we are talking now. Because the arguments, we cannot go to it now. Because Egypt is insisting on historical right, Ethiopia is insisting on equitable utilization. This would not take us much, all right? But the technical people have to sit together, identify the needs, and see the available water, how many billion cubic meters we have of water, and then work it out. And it is possible to do it. Thank you. I'm going to take Haley and then I'll go Hi, I'm Amy Davidson from the Crisis Action. Um, firstly, thank you, Your Excellency, for an incredible tour de force of some of the different, um, different issues on the continent. Um, you talked a bit about South Sudan um, and the importance of trying to form some government of national unity. Um, it seems there's quite some concern that President Kia might <clears throat> seek to go ahead and form a transitional government without Riek Machar, um, and that obviously poses a risk to, to the ongoing peace process. In the event that that did happen, and that it seemed that the, um, the existing um, uh, peace process begins to collapse, do you think there is a role um, for President Abiy and the AU to step in where the where EGAD has been failing to bring bring the parties together and to get real movement towards peace and South Sudan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Ambassador, that was indeed a, a wonderfully fascinating tour d'horizon you did, not just about uh, Prime Minister Abiy's efforts to build an inclusive and prosperous Ethiopia, but his uh, initiatives across the borders with Eritrea, he played a very major role in Sudan, and Addis has always been the multilateral capital of Africa, so boxes above its weight in that way. What I'd like to ask, uh, he, uh, the Prime Minister is showing incredible courage 
in changing a whole culture, as you mentioned, um, there are obviously vested interests who are badly affected. Uh, when one group has to cede power to, to the nation as a whole, uh, there are people who feel deprived of power, who feel very um, angry as a result. There are others who always felt they've not had a fair share of the pie, who therefore overnight want much more than they, the, the government can deliver. Can one, can one man with all the will in the world do this alone? Is the Prime Minister getting partners in this exercise internally, other stakeholders who say, yes, we have a leader here we need to work with, rather than constantly undermine? You said he's had a, a coup attempt against him, assassination attempts. Can he do this alone? And are there people who are coming to the party with him saying, we'll do this with you? Thank you. Shall we address this yes, too? Yes. Thank you very much. My sister over there on South Sudan. Uh, South Sudan is, is still a very difficult place and a very difficult problems to solve. Uh, because the conflict goes back to early 1990s when they went out to the bush to fight Khartoum. And then the bloodbath that they unleashed happened in the 1990s. So any problem you are talking to solve now, it goes back to 1993, 1992, 1989, or even when they were in Khartoum in school, or to Anania 1, that is 1960s, uh, 70s, 80s. So that thing is, is, is there in the mind of uh, these people. And the competition between the Dinka tribe, that is the majority where the president belongs, and the majority is not absolute, it's about 35%. And you have the new era where Ria comes from. And he believes that he should lead the country after the days of John Garang. And that's what's happening. But the new era are like 30%, 29%. And you have the Equatoria, who used to be spectators between the Nuer and the Dinka for a long time. Now they are asserting themselves. And we have got other opposition political parties, a lot of them. South Sudan, with 10 million people, there are 64, 65 ethnic groups. Each one finding its place. And the best way to get it is to be strong on the ground and to have the gun. And that mentality has to be worked on. But now, the pressure seems, Security Council was there in Juba last week, and in Addis Ababa with my Prime Minister. Yeah. What they have said is, despite the problems, uh, Riyak Mashar has to agree to form the unity government on November 12. And Riyak saying no, simply because the cantonment process is not yet done. Cantonment has its own implications. We in the diplomatic community, myself and team, suspect that cantonment uh, is a nice concept to bring your troops in the name of cantonment as much as you can. So that in case of a problem before three years, of the transition. And I expect at the end of transition we might have a problem, not during the transition, at the end of the transition, that you have to fight it out. We have to reserve now in the name of cantonment as much troops as possible. If you lose the game now, you lost it in three years later. So those kind of calculations are there. But despite we are saying, and IGAT, International Community Security Council, please form the government and let's address it uh, one after another and do not contemplate the day you are going to fight. Rather think the day you compete for election as much as possible. The first election can have a problem. The second election could be better. The third could be perfect. And you have to go through it. Better to have here and there some problems, loss of life and property, very limited, than an all-out conflict that you are thinking now in the name of cantonment. So this is all about 
South Sudan. But the answer is better to have the government formed, and then we start the transition, all problems to be uh, addressed. If the president wishes to form without Riyak Masha, still we will have a problem. Less of the problem is to have the unity government without complete canton process, cantonment process. And the worst problem will be to form the government without Riyak Masha. So still, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. We have to, we have to uh, see what will happen. But I think Riyak Masha will be persuaded and he will join as deputy uh, president. And my brother, as you said it, uh, we have to institutionalize. Uh, we have to have many voices to support the prime minister. But Ethiopia is now in the middle of two issues. One is pan-Ethiopianism that want to have Ethiopia at its heart. Half part of that is the concept of regionalism. No, no, no. We are different ethnic groups. We are languages. We are cultures. We must have it at the region, not at the national level. And the Prime Minister said, no, it is possible to do both. And there are many who are saying no to him. So regionalism and pan-Ethiopianism are neck and neck in Ethiopia. We will see which one come over. Uh, but until then, uh, we have to minimize the damage. And in May, we will have election. That election, despite uh, the fact that it will be difficult, it will help us to know the size of each politician, each group, and each uh, personality. Uh, that's what we are uh, trying to do. Uh, we need your prayers also with us. Thank you. I wonder if you could address the question that I have, which is, you talked Please. about the transitional uh, government uh, in, in Sudan, um, but I guess I just you talked about as you have this sort of coalition and everybody's focused on, on their issues and whatnot over the next three years, what is the likelihood that that Sudan could actually fall back into uh, some sort of deep conflict because these parties are actually focused on sort of the power sharing agreement because you have one tra one period or the government uh, the uh, military side in power for one one period and then the civilian part over. Mm -hmm. um, what is the likelihood of the of what do you see as the likelihood of being uh, violence that outburst of violence because of this these issues? Yeah, uh, we are right, Dr. Andrew. Uh, still, Sudan is at crossroads, and uh, don't forget the military, the other half part of the government, uh, still is strong. Uh, which has its relations with the Gulf countries and with other many uh, friends of that group. And still, they are deployed in Yemen. Uh, and the resources they control is there. And it is like a deep state for the last 20, 40 years. And these are the group who allowed the civil society to come in. And the civil society was that took over power with the military they were disconnected for so many from the country, yes, and now they have come back and fragmented. And the opposition itself has a problem within themselves, all right? And the problem of Sudan was the disagreement between the civil and political parties, either, as many say, corrupt, either not have the right view, or either very far apart from each other. You have Al-Islam al ikwan the Muslim Brotherhood followers of Sudan, those of Al-Turabi and extremists. And you have a Communist Party still operating. From all over the world, it's only in Khartoum that you have a Communist Party, up to now. So these are the extremes you have in the civil society that join the government. And you have a military that was very strong, full of resources, uh, I mean, uh, with all the power. Now. After some time, the civilians have to come over uh, to replace Burhan, General Burhan. That could be the time we have to be careful. And the international community must help the Prime Minister to balance all this. And assistance from the international community has to follow the 
right way, institutional way, including from our Gulf countries. All right, they have to assist the government in a formal way than the previous relationship they had developed for a long time. Uh, so, uh, what encourages me is the people of Sudan uh, would not allow any breakup of the country. If they were to allow, because Sudan is diverse, uh, it should have happened last year, mm. you know, all these problems. But they came together at the end, they blocked the road, they <coughs> overcome the killings and the shootings, and finally they went home as the agreement was signed. So the indication from people is very clear, the majority, from Darfur up to Beja, from Blue Nile up to Aswan, people have stood together. But still Sudan within itself, not only the political parties, but us people, they have, they have got a lot of problems. Some say the politics of Sudan is the politics of Khartoum related to Arabs. Where are the rest? So these issues they have to handle slowly. And the democratization and equal opportunity and economic recovery would be a step forward. But I must say, the big countries like UK, US, they must come to rescue this government, uh, to rescue this setup, to rescue this transition, which I do not see is enough. It is not enough. Uh, Sudan is a very big country and potentially the richest. If the transition works out well, elections are done and the people are free, very peaceful country and with a lot of resources. Yeah, this is what I can say. Uh, Nina. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, talk. Um, my name is Max Frank, I'm an intern here. Uh, my question is, do you believe that the United States should withdraw the sanctions against Sudan? Is it the right time or is it too soon? Yeah, for sure. Nina. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for your interesting insights on Ethiopia's relationships, especially with, uh, with its neighbors. Um, my question um, concerns more uh, Ethiopia internally. So next month the referendum is scheduled for the autonomy of the Sudama region. Yeah. And I was wondering uh, how you would see in case uh, it will be a yes vote, um, so uh, Sidama will become a separate region. How will this affect the already fragmenting ruling coalition? Is it likely that the Sidama region will demand its seat on the table in the ruling coalition? And a bit more question <coughs> to that as well. Um, how, do you, what, uh, how do you see the role of the, the ruling coalition um, uh, and its fragmentation in uh, with regards to the elections scheduled for 2020? Thank you. Uh, my brother, the U.S. is already late to lift the sanction uh, considering Sudan as a state sponsoring terrorism. Because uh, if the U.S. doesn't do it quick, uh, it doesn't mean uh, help much. Uh, <coughs> they have gone far to the extent of talking to handover al-Bashir to ICC. This is a big sacrifice. The leadership now, if they do it. But the mere thinking of it shows you how far they want to disengage from the past. And if democratization takes root, uh, there is no way a government in Khartoum would sponsor any terrorism. And now, it's not existing that sponsorship of terrorism doesn't exist in Sudan. And now we have a prime minister, a civil servant, international civil servant, heading the government, and a coalition government in place. And if U.S. doesn't show the diplomatic and the political uh, direction, who else would do it? So uh, it is like not appreciating the changes in Sudan. There is no reason. And I, I, I say it is a day before that it should have been done. And if there is an element in Sudan which you cannot 
rule out who would have a relationship with any group, either ISIS, Muslim Brotherhood, or in Gaza, Hamas, they can target those groups based on evidence. Otherwise, collectively, now keeping the sanction, continuing it, is unreasonable. Okay, that's what uh, uh, I can say. On the Sidama, my sister, personally, I think they will overwhelmingly vote uh, to have a region of their own. One, the issue is 30, 40 years old. They were looking for it. And in 1991, when the military dictatorship was overthrown, Sidama was a region. It is the mistake of that government also to deny that status. And now it came after the change with the new prime minister. It is a democratic right. And the best way is to do it referendum, not UK way, but Ethiopian way, <laughs> 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 which you hold <laughs> some unease here. Uh, then if they vote, the prime minister will accept it, the parliament will accept it, the whole country will accept it, and they will become, now we have nine regions, it will be tenth. There could be some, again, who would want to follow that route. As long as they have done it peacefully, they have to be given the opportunity. So we don't see any problem if Ethiopia becomes 15 regional states instead of nine. But every Tom and Jerry should not ask for it. Because we are 60, 82 ethnic groups and languages. We can't have 82. But tolerable up to 15, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this Sidama issue is exceptional. There are areas with the status of a region that are not even one-tenth of Sidama. Sidama is like five million, comparable to Tigray region, comparable to Somali region. And they, uh, they were asking for it, and they have fought for it like 40, 30 years. And now a reformist prime minister has come, he cannot say no. He would only ask them, do it peacefully. And we see the referendum. If they have chosen so, it will be granted. Yes, after getting uh, that status of a region, they will share the cake. Part of their, we have a chemistry, uh, ethnic chemistry, how to do it. What percentage of ministries, what percentage of ambassadorship, what percentage of this and that, parastatals, you will take. And they will share it. That way, if we get peace, there is no problem. That's my answer. Tim, and then... Um, thank you. Thank you, Tim, Tim Morris. I had the honor of uh, being a British ambassador in Juba with the ambassador. And uh, I'm going to ask about something else, but uh, uh, I, I would just like to thank you for your, your leadership when, when we were all there together. Uh, you led the, the EGAD. Uh, effort there, which was the key to to what progress we made, and we shared the same frustrations and the same the same friendship, and a few very good Ethiopian coffees. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask about something else, really, which is around Africa, mm. and of course, uh, Addis hosts the African Union, and Ethiopia is a major major player. Uh, does the the government and the prime minister have a have a new uh, agenda or particular ideas for the continent? I'm thinking of things like free trade area uh, and other areas. Are there just a few words you can give us about uh, Ethiopia's vision for, for the continent? Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Your Excellency, for a really, really interesting talk. Um, you mentioned already um, the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Um, my name is Hannah Wadilov, I'm the researcher for the FCO. Um, and I wanted uh, you to elaborate a little bit further on what you feel is needed uh, to institutionalize that deal between leaders. Um, you mentioned adjustments that were needed from the Eritrean side, and I'd be interested to know what you feel the um, blockages are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Yes, uh, we shared a very uh, good and bad moment in uh, Juba. 
we have succeeded, uh, but there were also areas we failed to do simply because the issues are not that easy uh, about South Sudan. Uh, free de- trade area, the African free trade area is now operational uh, as of May uh, 2019. Uh, so it is the policy frameworks and the customs that they have to, uh, at the technical level, finalize and start it. That is something good. Uh, Ethiopia cannot alone face China. Neither Somalia or South Sudan or Djibouti, very tiny. But when we come together, really we can be a block uh, to face the EU, American economy, Russian economy, Chinese economy, and UK, if it comes out or it remains in, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, as the Prime Minister came in, we had some debates within ourselves, at the government, whether we should join it or we, we, we not to be the 20th to get it operational. But as this Prime Minister came, we have to be the one. So it showed us that he is pro continental free trade uh, agreement and operationalization. Uh, His vision for the continent is still very difficult uh, to come together 54 countries with one uh, line of thinking. Still we have those differences. uh, Anglophone, uh, Francophone, uh, well developed, uh, not yet. Fragile states, well moving states. We have those uh, different paces. Uh, some uh, democratizing, still some uh, way back. All right. And we have that diverse situation uh, in, the, in, in the continent. Uh, yeah, we were uh, much more of an organization of African unity. Now we came to the African Union where the focus should be 2063 integration, which we started with a free trade area. It is an opportunity to the whole world, and it's an opportunity for Africans uh, to move together. Uh, otherwise, when the Prime Minister was uh, uh, approved to, to win the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, this is for Africa. And the whole Africa is being looked at, how we do things, and I wish all of you follow my roots. So that is the sentimental relationship he has. Otherwise, what he's doing in the region is to strengthen the continental uh, uh, sense of coming together, all right? Uh, But we are active participants at the African Union. We will see. Thank you. Otherwise, the Ethiopia Eritrea, my sister from FCO, is uh, a bit difficult. Uh, We have both our internal challenges. Uh, so, uh, as you know, Ethiopia conflict uh, is much more of uh, the genesis, and a good part of it up to now is what is the problem in Tigray, and uh, what is the problem in Eritrea, Tigrinya speaking, which unfortunately are the same language, the same culture, the same church, the same tradition, everything. They have lived for centuries together. And because of that, what we are going to do now has got its own implications in both. And because of that, we said, take your time. We will take our time. This is just now eight, nine months since we opened it and closed it again. We take our time. We will do it. But both cannot afford to go back or backtrack from what we have started. Uh, I think uh, next election in Ethiopia in May uh, will uh, will give us some sort of way forward on how to deal with uh, this situation. Uh, But for the moment, at the leadership, there is a good understanding. Uh, But has it gone down on those concerned communities, not yet. I have to be very frank with you. But the rest, the majority of Ethiopians now, there is a television station dedicated to receive calls 
and appearing in person of Eritreans and Ethiopians who lost their people, their wives and kids and brothers, nieces and uh, nephews, like 20 years. And still that television program is busy. So that legacy, really nobody wants it to, to come back again. That, uh, so uh, we have to wait a little bit. And when uh, it is right time, it will happen. Thank you. Okay. Andre, you have the last question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Andre Kosaro, Internet, uh, the Institute, part of uh, CSDP. First of all, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your great insights on the various challenges that Africa is facing and the ways that Ethiopia is tackling various issues. Uh, one interesting aspect to know further would be about the 900,000 refugees and asylum seekers in Ethiopia, uh, with a majority of refugees from South Sudan, uh, Eritrea, and Somalia. Uh, as we know, this is uh, the second largest refugee population in Africa. And um, it would be interesting, first of all, to know what are the biggest challenges that uh, IDPs are facing uh, in Ethiopia, and also what are the steps taken by Ethiopia for local integration uh, of these uh, individuals? Yeah. The, yes, the refugees are really massive in the Horn of Africa. I just can tell you, when we had uh, 2013, the conflict in South Sudan, and again 2016, the adjacent border region in Ethiopia, Gambella region, the refugee camp was not anymore to sustain or to receive any refugees. So we had to open another one in the northern part of Gambella, which is called Benishangul Gumus area. We had to again open a big camp in another region. And this is not easy for South Sudanese. This is not easy for Ethiopia. To the extent what is coming from Somalia and what is coming from South Sudan, it is changing the demography of Ethiopia itself and having implications on the politics, election. It's not easy now who's voting you to office, you don't know. Maybe somebody crossing from the border. All right. Uh, the economic impact, you know it. But still, my prime minister is saying we have to continue generous uh, to refugees. And from Eritrea, so many come. We don't keep them much in the camps. And they integrate and go to universities. And those who are lucky will come to London or Washington. They can process their things. Somalia, the same. The same people, we cannot keep them in the camp. It is just a formality. They will come in and out. And if you go to South Sudan, the same. They just live in the huts uh, with their people. Uh, that kind of generosity is very difficult in Europe. You know the politics of uh, accepting refugees in the Mediterranean Sea. So many are losing life simply because of resistance. But there, the generosity is there. Uh, all African countries, uh, we are uh, similar on this, and we are very happy. Because today's problem, I have to share it with you. Tomorrow it will be me coming to you. That uh, uh, thing is there. But the ultimate solution is development, peace, democratization, and economic liberalization. Nothing else. If we do peace, South Sudan can supply its oil to Ethiopia. Ethiopia can supply electricity to it. And Sudan can feed the whole continent or at least the Horn of Africa. And Egypt can export a lot of industrial products to Africa. So we have our competitive advantage. Uh, so that is the only way we can uh, move on. But uh, to, be, to continue to be generous and uh, receiving. And uh, Uganda... Uh, they have more than one million South Sudanese living in there. But still, President Museveni is giving them a plot of land to come and integrate and uh, be productive. All right? Uh, Kenya is the most liberal country in terms of refugees. They are accepting so many people from all over the region. And whenever we have a problem, we rush to Kenya from all over the region. So this kind of uh, mentality and uh, thinking and concept have to, has to continue, but the, 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 the strategy should be uh, ensuring peace first and foremost.
that is what is driving people. Second is uh, economy. Economic migrants could be contained in there. This is how I see it. Brilliant. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you. Of our time. Uh, can we just can you join me in thanking the rest of the